Good morning. Good to see everybody here this morning and hope you are doing well and enjoying this winter slash spring type weather. Here lately, the past couple Sundays, I've been talking about, it's been kind of a theme about the uh, subject uh, we've been looking at, and that is, uh, the theme would be that of salvation. And so, I've been looking at the topics of justification, sanctification, and then as I said this morning, we would look at a question that uh, may get asked by some people who may not be that familiar with the Bible or who out, uh, would ask outside the church, you know, How come there are so many answers to this one question? And that one question is, as what the Philippian jailer asked in Acts chapter 16 and verse 30, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And if you think about that, what more important question in your life could you ever ask that you could come up with? And, you know, this here is the most important question. This is what it all comes down to This question, this is what our whole entire life, when we get to the end of our life, this is what it all comes down to. What must I do to be saved? And so if we look into the scriptures here, and as you have maybe talked with other people or have read in the Bible yourself, you probably notice, let's start like within Acts chapter 2 and verse 37 with the Jews there on Pentecost. When uh, they had just realized that they had just crucified their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and so... Peter tells them, in, or then in verse 37, it said they were pricked in their heart. And they asked the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? And so Peter's response was, in verse 38, he tells them to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we got repent and be baptized. And then if we go a little bit further into the book of Acts, and let's say in chapter 9, when we look at uh, Saul who later became the Apostle Paul. But in Acts chapter 9, in verse 6, and this is right after when uh, Jesus had just appeared to him on the road to Damascus and told him, or asked him, why are you persecuting me? And so Saul asked the question, he said, what do you want me to do? And so uh, the Lord told him, he said, go into Damascus, and there you'll be told what you must do. And so Ananias was told by the Lord to go tell him what to do. And so in uh, in verse 18 of chapter 9, and then also uh, chapter 22 and verse 16 is a more detailed uh, instruction of of that verse. Ananias tells him in uh, 22 and 16, and this is is when Paul is uh, before the Jerusalem mob, he's given a recount of of what happened to him. In 22, 16, he is told one thing that he must do, and Ananias said, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Okay, so we have be bapti- arise and be baptized, wash away your sins, but he didn't mention repentance. But then we go to uh, chapter 16, where there we read about the Philippian jailer, Acts chapter 16, in verse 30 right there. When the Philippian jailer, he comes up to Paul and Silas and he asks them the question, he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so they told him, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you and all your household, and you will be saved. Okay, well, we got a different answer here. And then let's say you you read also in the Bible and other places. Now, like John chapter 3, verse 16, most people are very familiar with that verse. For God so loved the world, gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. So there he says that we must believe in order to have everlasting life. So that goes along with what... Uh, they told the Philippian jailer here. But then we go to like uh, Romans chapter 10 in verse 9 where there uh, the apostle Paul when he is addressing uh, the people of Israel and he said you know they were they had not yet obeyed the gospel but he said in verse 9 he said that if they would just confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead they shall be saved. Well, okay, we have a different answer here. And then also, let's say in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, you have Jesus himself saying right before he ascended up into heaven, he told his disciples, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. And so we have about probably about five different answers here to this one question. And so that would raise a good question to someone who... Uh, is, you know, looking into the Bible about what they must do to be saved. 
And so a logical question will be to ask, well, which one is it? Which one of these answers is the right one? Or are they, are they all right? Or do I have to do all of them? Or is there a certain order I have to do them in? Or do I just pick one that best suits me? Um, you know, how will I know if I'm doing them right? And so certainly that is a good logical question uh, for anyone to ask. And hopefully, you know, if anyone's ever wondered this question, or if you would like to know how to answer this question who somebody might would ask you, uh, hopefully this lesson here will help you out this morning. So I'd say the first thing that we must do in order to answer this question is like what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. He said, study to show thyself approved, a worker that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In other words, we need to get in to the word of God. We need to open up our Bibles and we need to study God's word. And that is how we start finding the answers. So we begin by opening our Bibles. We get into the word of God. Now, uh, sometimes, you know, people will need a little help. And that certainly is nothing to be ashamed of. All of us at one time or another have had to ask for help in order to know what must I do to be saved or any other question. Um, in Acts chapter 8, if you remember whenever Philip, he went up to the Ethiopian eunuch and uh, he heard the eunuch reading from the prophet Isaiah. And he asked the eunuch, he said, do you understand what it is you're reading? And the eunuch's response was, he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And so, perfectly good question to ask because, you know, for those who have understood and have obeyed the gospel, you know, are able to help those who have not yet obeyed the gospel. Okay, so now if I'm asking someone for help, then I may ask them, the question is, well, okay, now how do I know you're telling me the truth? You know, you may be of this sect or whatever. Or they may say you, you believe this way. So how do I know I'm not getting a biased opinion here or a biased answer? Well, the Bible gives us an answer for that. How are we to deal with that? Uh, Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21, he said, test all things and hold fast to what is good. Perfectly common, you know, that's common sense. That's a good answer right there. So we test what the people say, and if we find what matches up with the word of God, we hold on to that. Uh, that the best example you might find would be in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, when he talks about the Bereans there, where it said there that, those, uh, the Bereans, they were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness. In other words, they were, they listened to the, what they, uh, what Paul had to say. They listened to what he said. And so they listened with all readiness. And then what did they do after that? They searched the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. What more can you do? So it's obviously uh, clear, you know, how do we know if someone's telling us the truth? Well, we uh, compare it with what the Bible says, and we can tell if they're telling us the truth or not. And then also, if uh, looking for an answer to anything, you know, uh, it doesn't hurt to pray to ask God for help, for guidance for this. Um, you know, in uh, Acts chapter 10, you know, even there Cornelius, we know that he had yet not obeyed the gospel, but yet he prayed to God, and he prayed uh, asking, you know, for guidance, and so that's according to God's will. And so later he sent Peter and he told him later what he must do. So getting back to this question right here, um, why do we have, why do we read of different answers to being saved within the scriptures? Now I'd say just like anywhere where you want to go, uh, you know, we usually say, well, if you want to get from point A to point B, you know, you, there's a starting place and there's a finishing place where we want to be. Uh, you know, we go to point A to point B, you know, we have a starting point. We would, you know, you might would call this the road to salvation. Um, where we want to be would be probably like what uh, Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, where he said there that uh, he was addressing the, the people, the members of the church there, when he said, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him. And it said that they were not a people of... Uh, God but they now are a people of God and have obtained mercy and so that's where we want to be so let's say to illustrate this let's say we start in Bergman and I'm going geographically here 
If we start out here in Bergman and someone asks the question, well, how do I get to Little Rock? And so somebody would answer that question, well, first you got to get on Highway 7 South, go to Harrison, then you would turn left on I-65 going south, you would go through Marshall, then you would go through Clinton, you would go through Conway, and once you get to Conway, you take I-40 and then you go on south down to Little Rock. Okay, so you have an answer there. Let's say someone who is in Clinton asks the same question. And so they ask the same question, then that person's going to hear the answer, well, you got to get on I-65 or Highway 65 South and then go down to Conway and get on I-40 South and now take a Little Rock. Well, there's a different answer right there. It wouldn't be logical for them to say, well, you're going to have to get on Highway 7 South, go to Harrison, turn left, and then go through Marshall, go through Clinton. You know, they wouldn't have to start at the beginning like the other person had to. And, you know, the same goes for uh, someone who would be in Conway. You know, if they ask the question, they say, well, just get on I-40 South and head on down to Little Rock. Well, that would be a different answer than what a person who is in Clinton would get. And so the thing is here is that um, geographically, these people here, are their starting points are at different locations. And so uh, just like, you know, spiritually, now spiritually, there is only one way to get to heaven, obviously. John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. Now, although geographically we know there are several ways to get to Little Rock, but, you know, uh, you wouldn't be too happy with the one who would tell you to go to Fayetteville, to Fort Smith, and then go to Little Rock. So, but spiritually, it is not the same geographically. You know, spiritually, there is only one way to heaven, and that is Christ. In fact, if you read, there's about five times in the book of Acts, and if you do a word search on your Bible app or something, and you type in the way, you'll notice that I think it's about five times in the book of Acts where it is referred to as, in a proper noun, of the way. You know, even Saul of Tarsus, he persecuted the way. And so... There is only one way in order to, uh, for one to be saved, one to get to heaven. So just as the people here in the Bible were given different answers, they were in different locations, different starting points, in order to get to where they needed to be, to the same destination. And so, you know, some people, they were closer than others, some were further than others, so therefore they had different answers because they were at different starting points, but they all got to the same destination. So let's say, for instance, the uh, Jews on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 36. Again, I'm going to kind of just go through this. Now, Peter right here, he is just um, finishing up his sermon. his explaining to the, people, the Jews here as to why all the men were speaking in different tongues when they thought they were drunk. Well, no, he's explaining what's really going on here. But by the time he got to the end of his explanation, the end of his sermon, he said, Therefore, now this is the sum of it, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so then, now we go to Acts chapter 16, when we look at the account of the Philippian jailer. Now we're going to kind of compare these two. Acts chapter 16, and let's go down to about verse 30. Acts chapter 16, verse 30. And he, that is the Philippian jailer, he brought Paul and Silas out of the prison here. And then he asked them the question. He says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Then they said to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and all your household. Now, most people who believe belief only will stop right there and not finish reading the rest of it. So, when we read this right here, if we look down in verse 32, this gives us some more information here. It says, uh, then, they spoke, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. And he took them the same hour that night and washed their stripes. And immediately, that must mean pretty important, immediately. 
He and all his family were baptized. So what is the difference between the Philippian jailer here being told if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ you'll be saved versus what Peter said. He told them, he said, well, you need to repent and be baptized. Well, the difference was here is that the Jews, when they asked the question, what, when did they ask the question, what, you know, what shall we do? Peter had just told them the gospel. He had explained to them what had just happened. So they had just heard the gospel, so now no doubt already they believe. Versus the Philippian jailer, he asked the question before he heard the gospel. And so that is the difference right here is that when they told him believe because he did not know what to believe yet. And so that's why they're telling him what to believe or who to believe on. So there's a difference right there is that because the Jews, they had already believed, they already heard, but the Philippian jailer had not yet heard what it was that he must do. So now if we look into uh, Saul, go back a few chapters to chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 and verse 3. Now, again, I'm just kind of briefly going through a context here. And as he, as he, that is Saul, journey, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said to him, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goats. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And so then, like I said, you go down to verse 18. Uh, this, is what he, this is the action that he was told to do. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, because he was blinded. And he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Now we don't see here where Ananias has given him the instruction at what he must do. Um, if you go to chapter 22, that's where, like I said, whenever Saul, or the Apostle Paul, when he is before the Jerusalem mob explaining to them what had happened to him, he gives a little bit more detailed uh, information right here that you don't read in Acts chapter 9. So in Acts 22 and verse 16, you, hear, you have here Ananias specifically telling Saul what he must do, uh, what the Lord uh, said he must do. He said, and now while you're waiting, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And so we see right here, he had no doubt, he no doubt already uh, believes, and no doubt is uh, penitent, he has a penitent heart about what he has done, and so he has repented of his sins, and he had already confessed the Lord, and so there was only one thing left for him to do, and that was to wash away his sins but what was he told to do to wash his sins away he said Ananias told him arise in other words get up off your feet because he was on the ground arise and be baptized and wash away your sins and so we see right here that even these three accounts right here they had different starting places but yet they had the same destination and what when they got to the same destination it ended with being baptized for the remission of their sins or wash away their sins and so this is where the apostles or even the disciples told them where they needed to be um, now let's say in Romans chapter 10 verses 1 through 10 when we uh, have a different answer right here we're going to look examine this uh, answer Romans chapter 10 in verse 1 now, this is just, I'm just going to kind of read through these uh, verses right here to, so we kind of understand the context of it. Uh, now, this is uh, the Apostle Paul speaking here. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, he's talking about Israel here, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. So, any, so in other words, their own righteousness is not, uh, does not mean what they're doing is right. So they have not submitted to God's righteousness. He says in verse 4, he says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. 
For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does these things shall live by them. And so here's what Israel's problem was, is they were still holding on to the old law of Moses, the law that they were raised up with here. And he says in verse 6, he says, But the righteousness of faith... <clears throat> speaks in this way, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, that is uh, to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, versus the, the law of Moses here, what they are uh, going by. And so what they preach is right here in verse 9, <clears throat> that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, like I was saying last week, the Greek word here for unto is pros, and so that means this right here is done towards or concerning salvation. So uh, believing and confessing are being done towards salvation that goes pretty much along with what the other people are told how to get to uh, salvation they had to go through uh, believe and confess in uh, confessing but the problem right here is when he only mentions that <clears throat> in verse 9 he says if you if you confess and if you believe they would be saved well that was their issue right here in this context here is that Israel would not even uh, believe or confess that Christ what or that Jesus was the Christ son of God and so if they would at least get past that point if they would just believe that he is the Christ son of living God they would just confess him as their Lord and so they would do the rest no doubt that is the problem they had to get past they just could not get over that particular hump right there so now we also let's uh Look in Acts chapter 8, verse 35. Acts chapter 8 and verse 35. <clears throat> now right here, this is where uh, Philip is uh, preaching to the, he's a preacher to the Ethiopian eunuch. And Acts chapter 8 and verse 35, it said, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus unto him, and there, he's beginning in Isaiah, now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what hinders me uh, from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. No doubt you had the belief and a confession right there. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Notice he didn't do the rejoicing before the baptism. He, wanted, he came upon some water. He said, what hinders me from being baptized? He wanted to take care of that issue first. And so when we see right here <clears throat> that he no doubt, he believed, he confessed, but he obviously understood that he had to be baptized uh, for the same reasons as the Jews on Pentecost, for the same reason as uh, uh, Saul was when he was told to wash his sins away. And so this goes right along with what Jesus said in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16 when he told his disciples, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes, in other words, that means that covers everybody. That's the starting point. He who believes and is baptized, finishing point, will be saved. And notice that baptized is in the past tense. It is not in a future tense, so it was not done later. If a person believes and is baptized, they will be saved. And so that right there, we see that it is kind of it is like a road to salvation. Everybody, the reason we had different answers is that Everybody had different starting places on the road to salvation. Now, what about also, you hear uh, even from other denominations, well, what about calling upon the name of the Lord? What does that mean? Uh, let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14, and we'll begin right there. For, or 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. <clears throat> Verse 14. 
As it says right here, to which he, that is Jesus, called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he is called, he is calling people by his, uh, their gospel, by the gospel that they preach. The Lord is calling those who have not yet obeyed it. Uh, he is calling them. And so calling upon the name of the Lord is actually an answering to this call right here, an answering uh, to the gospel call, as you might say. Um, when Peter was giving his sermon in Acts chapter 2 and verse 21, where it says, and, whoever, and it says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, what did they do to call upon the name of the Lord? Where do we read in the scriptures what they did to call upon the name of the Lord? Well, as we get to verse 38, they were only told to do two things, repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins, and they shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And also, Saul was told the same thing by Ananias when it said, he said, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord, as the rest of that verse says. And so how we call upon the name of the Lord is we do the same thing they did, is that we are baptized for the remission of our sins or to wash our sins away, same thing. And so we call upon the name of the Lord by answering the gospel call. Now, um, there's that point every Sunday where I lose my track. <laughs> but anyway, um, in chapter 9, uh, where we see where the Lord, when the Lord appears to Saul, and tells him what it was that he must do. Now, some people will believe that calling upon the name of the Lord means to pray to him. In other words, taking that literally. Uh, saying, you know, well, to call upon the name of the Lord, well, we got to literally do that with our own voice. We got to call. And, and so the only way you can uh, talk to the Lord or call upon him is, you know, we do that through prayer. But where do we read in the scriptures where anyone who it says or we're told to call upon the name of the Lord, where do we read anywhere where it's said that they are told to pray to call upon the name of the Lord or to pray for salvation or prayer even mentioned at all? Um, like I said, if we go to Acts chapter 9 in uh, verses 10 and 11, Now again, this is uh, the example of, the, of Saul of Tarsus. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is what? He is praying. And so then later... We get down into verses 17 and 18. So Ananias goes to him and tells him what to do. He says in verse 17, And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So here and upon that time, you know, they, laid, they had the laying on of hands of the Holy Spirit, which that's another subject for another time. And so that is how he received his sight. He was uh, miraculously healed. And it said, there fell, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. And so if we read in chapter 22, verse 16, where Ananias specifically told Saul, where he said, and now while you're ready and rise and be baptized, why didn't he just say, stay right where you are now, I know you've been praying for three days because uh, it said that he'd been uh, there without food and drink for three days in verse uh, Acts 9 9. But he said, I know you've been praying for three days, so now repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I, you know, I pray that I, I accept you into my heart. You know how the sinner's prayer goes. And I pray that you'll come into my life and forgive me of my sins. Do you see where Ananias ever said anything even remotely close to that? He told him only one thing to do, and that was to, again, arise and be baptized and wash away his sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. And so the way they called upon the name of the Lord and the way we do it today is exactly the way they did it back then, is we do the same thing by, by being baptized for the remission of our sins. So how we call upon the name of the Lord and receive, uh, 
like I said, is to be baptized, but how does this work? When, um, when we're being baptized, we are obeying the gospel. But what is the gospel? Because if you remember when uh, Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7, and this also goes along with what Jesus was saying in Mark 16, 16. If I can get my pages to turn right there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7. And to give you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So those who have not yet obeyed the gospel are the ones who are going to suffer from uh, eternal punishment. So how do you obey the gospel? What specifically does the Bible say the gospel is? If you go over to the book of Corinth, uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he tells us specifically what is the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, verse one, starting in verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you receive in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. So now here's what the gospel is. He says, For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and he arose the third day according to the scriptures. So the gospel is, is that Jesus, he died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. The gospel, that would be good news, and that's what the gospel is, is good news. But how do we obey a death, burial, resurrection? How do we obey the good news? And if we look over into Romans chapter 6, or Romans chapter 6, it tells us how we obey the gospel, how it works, how the gospel and baptism are connected, how it is a calling upon the name of the Lord. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3 says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized, he's talking about those who have already been baptized, or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we, are, therefore, we were buried with him through the sinner's prayer. No, he says, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified, therefore the old man is being put to death, and that the body of sin might be done away with, and that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And so here the, the baptism is a burial. It is how we obey the gospel. We bury the old man in the water, and so he is dying, he is buried in the water, and then we rise up to walk in a newness of life. And so that is how we obey the gospel. You know, it does not teach us how we obey the gospel in any other way. Now, again, like I said before, it's nothing magical about the water, but it is where God said to do it. It's where he commands us to uh, have our sins washed away, and that's, it is the working of God according to Colossians chapter 2, uh, verses 11 through 14. And so, because it is an operation of God, it is a circumcision not made without hands, as uh, Paul said in Colossians chapter 2. And so it's nothing magical about the water, but it is the obedience to his command. And his command was to then, the same as with us today, from Acts chapter 2 till this very minute and beyond, we are all told to, uh, no doubt we have to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the God, Son of living God. We confess him before men, we repent of our sins, and then we are ready, we are candidates now to be baptized for the remission of our sins, which is the destination where we want to be. And then after that, you know, it doesn't end there. After that, as we become saved, as we are Christians, then we are to remain faithful unto death, Romans chapter 2 and verse 10. And so if anybody here this morning is ready to take that step, you know, we'd be happy to help you here as we are beginning to, as we... Uh, 
are about to offer the invitation. And again, you know, if you still would like some more information, uh, if you're not yet fully understanding everything that, you know, maybe I've said here in this lesson, because I can only say so much in a lesson, if you want to know more, you know, ask me or one of the men here. But if you're ready to take that step, we have the water ready. It's nice and warm. It's not freezing. And uh, we can help you here this morning. And if you are a Christian, you have obeyed the gospel. And if you're suffering through some times, you need the prayers of the church for strength or comfort or whatever it is, whatever need you have. If you want help from the church, we'll be happy to help you as well to pray for you. So if you have a need, come now as we stand and as we sing. <laughs>